Dollars to Donuts with your host, Steve Portugal. Welcome to the last episode of the first half of the second season of Dollars to Donuts, the podcast where we talk with the people who lead user research in their organization. This episode is brought to you by these Magnifico sponsors, the Pinterest research team, who work with designers, engineers, and everyone in between to build the world's most inspiring catalog of ideas. Envision, the world's leading product design and prototyping platform. Sign up free at envisionapp.com. And Airbnb's experience research team, making authentic, local experiences possible anywhere in the world. For help on articulating your company's vision for innovation, seek me out at portable.com. Buy my book, Interviewing Users, from Amazon and Rosenfeld Media, and keep your eyes open for a Chinese edition that just came out. Elizabeth Kell is the Senior Director of User Research at Comcast. She's worked in publishing and as a designer and, of course, a researcher and a manager. Liz is an amateur classical musician who avidly plays with others and in groups in her spare time. I'm really excited to talk with her on Dollars to Donuts. All right, Liz. Well, thank you. Thanks for being part of the podcast. Thanks, Steve. So I'm going to ask you the question that I always ask everybody at the start of almost every interview about any topic, I think it is, which is just to give a sort of a basic intro to start us off. Sure. So my name is Liz Kell. I'm the Senior Director of User Research here at Comcast uh, in our headquarters here in Philadelphia. I uh, run a team of 11, a diverse team of, of user researchers, um, and I've been doing this for about eight years. Another question that I often ask, people in the U.S. will know the Comcast name, other people might not. So, and probably there's some, I guess you can explain Comcast and we'll learn something about the company in terms of how you describe it. Sure. With that long preamble, like what is, what is, what is Comcast? What is Comcast for the folks who don't know or don't have the services at home? Uh, Comcast is the largest cable internet service provider in the United States. We have over, uh, I want to say 22 million video disc subscribers and, and 23 million high speed internet subscribers. I may be slightly off on those numbers, so hopefully nobody fact checks me. Um, we also provide a uh, digital voice service to the home, home security services. And, um, yeah, those are our four main business areas right now so that's what we do and what's with so within your group's purview i guess do you do you get involved in all those different areas of the business we're involved in all areas of the business um and in in the layers beneath too so all the service layers that go into supporting all four of those products and services that we deliver so we look at the customer service the whole customer end-to-end experience and that that includes everything from you know the the sales and the marketing and going in and observing you know what's going on in the call centers um to looking at the installation riding along with the agents watching people try to self-install kits watching people try to get self-help or call into the call center and troubleshoot and things like that so in addition to evaluating the product we're also evaluating the services and what just i mean when you say product for a company like comcast what's a product product i like i think of the product as like the like a physical so, thing? Sort of, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bunch of electrons, right? But, you know, the television is something that, that comes to this big screen on your TV, and you have the interface that you interact with, you have the set-top box that you interact with, you have the remote controls that you interact with. So that's, like, kind of the thing, and we do a lot of evaluating um, and trying to improve those things. For high-speed internet, you know, there's less to interact with. That was one of our big insights when we were doing some, some research on the high-speed internet product. Um, but really, how do people interact with that physical gateway, which is your modem and router in one? Um, with home security, there's a lot of interesting things to explore around, like, where do people decide to put the different sensors or, or what kind of different pieces of home, home automation are they adopting and why? And, and how are they using them and how are they controlling them, either through mobile or, or web interfaces? So there's a lot of, like, the thing, I would call it, like a tangible right. thing we're evaluating as well. So that's uh, is that that's hardware and software. Both, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, so these questions are naive because I don't necessarily have the language for them. But so there's hardware and software and services. But the services I feel like you're describing sort of are more customer support services. Are there other kinds of services Comcast delivers that you're examining or studying, trying to improve that aren't about sort of. Uh, Managing my success with the hardware and software, I guess. Really about uh, self service and, and getting help and being able to get the support you need for for your for your things. I keep calling them things. Right. Now. I think I got that word from you. <laughs> yeah. So so Comcast is a kind of a hardware and software company, and there's a service layer to enable hardware and software. 
I'm trying to think like someone that's like more of a because so, so a company that's a services company like has services as a thing that you would consume, but you'd only consume Comcast services in order to get to a point where you're having the hardware and software, the thing. Yeah, I mean, people subscribe to our services and they get something for it, which I consider, I call product. You know, we're part of a product organization. So people subscribe to our services. So it's really, I think, about figuring out how to get the help and support you need with the services and then being able to use the products. So we look at right. both. I don't know if I'm, I'm answering right. the Right, I think we're both totally confused now. <laughs> That's good. Let's see if we can get through this without using the word product or service or thing again. <laughs> so you started off, too, by describing the size of your team. Can we, can we go back in time and talk about the history of your role, sort of the history of user research and insights at Comcast? Sure, of course. So um, so I said I've been here, I'm coming up on eight years. Um, I was actually hired to be the, the first user researcher on staff um, when we moved into, we have a new headquarters here in, in Philly, which isn't really new anymore. Uh, we moved in almost eight years ago. It was a month after I started. And when we moved in, space was actually built out to have an internal usability lab, which was something that the company didn't have before. Um, so looking to you know bring some of this capability in-house rather than, than outsourcing it has been done in the past. So I started out as a team of one. And when I started in 2008, we really was just supporting a couple of different websites. So Comcast.net, uh, which was originally uh, the portal for our customers, high-speed internet customers to get their email. And it was similar to like Yahoo or AOL. And then Fancast.com, which was really one of the first destinations to go and watch, you know, full episodes or full movies online. So it's kind of an exciting space to be in, you know, the frontier of like watching TV online. In some ways, it seems like yesterday. In some some ways, it seems like, you know, ancient history. Um, But since then, you know, just every year, something new just kept coming into the fold. So that was 2008, 2009. We were working more on iPhone apps. Then the iPad came out. Then we started taking over the the TV interface. Um, And and you saw the result of that now. If anyone has our X1 system, that's that's the latest TV UI that that we worked on for many years. um, we also took on hardware, um, so looking at the design of the remote controls, set-top boxes, all kinds of things like that, um, starting then to move into services, um, looking at uh, the, the online, the acquisitions, the self-service, the My Account app. So the scope of what we touch just keeps growing, you know, looking at employee tools and some of the software that our agents use out in the field or, or helping with an engagement to try to evaluate and improve the, the, the tools that our techs use out in the field. So it's gotten to the point where we almost touch, like, anything that, that someone needs to interact within the company, which is really exciting. Um, And I've grown this from a team of one to a team of, we're up to 11 now in eight years. So um, I think that shows really great commitment in the company to to how important it is to understand your users and design for them. Right. Can you, so can you go back along that that timeline? You're sort of framing it around the um, things that Comcast was doing and then the way that, that you and your team were able to contribute. But something was also happening internally, I'm hypothesizing that, that started to say, hey, this this capability, these people that we have can help drive good design or good outcomes for customers. Do you are there sort of key moments or kind of transitional points that you can think about where wow, we're you know we're, yes, we can help with that. Yes, we're going to start doing that. Like, mm-hmm. how did that come about? That's a great question. Well, my background actually was more in field research and anthropology. I did the design research um, program at IIT Institute of Design. So I was more into field research, worked at Steelcase, and that's what they focused on before I came here. Um, But when I got here, you know, it was really about we need to start up this usability practice. And... I think the big wins in the beginning were there was definitely a hunger and appetite for this. And, and the woman who was leading the IA group at the time, Livia Labate, along with um, Tom Lortan, who's my uh, VP of UX, he's been my boss for the whole time I've been here. They, they had an appetite for this already. So I came in with two champions, you know, ready to support me. And it was pretty easy. There was just a hunger. And we just, you know, people who wanted testing and they wanted to see customers interacting with their interfaces, it was really easy to just get up and running and show some immediate results and and to, to show some immediate impact on the UI. So with that, the, the, I think the, the legend of my team started to grow, first within the UX group with designers coming to me saying, hey, we want to test this. Hey, we're working on this. Um, into you know, our, our close-knit neighbors, we were underneath the product organization, and we still are. So some of the, the close-knit neighbors in, in product started coming to us and saying, hey, I want to learn more about this or want to learn more about that. And then they would invite someone to a readout, and the next thing you know, someone from the business unit would be like, hey, can we use your group to, to learn more about our users in this way? Um, so I think it was kind of a bit of an organic growth and thinking about key moments that's a great question you know we've had a few of them I think you know we did a we did a big ethnographic study back in in 2011 it got a lot of attention from our, our GM for the BB, VBU, which is the video business unit, and then some of our market research partners, and then they started spreading the word and um, having us, you know, put our uh, 
our presentation up in front of other audiences within the company. Um, and one of the people I got connected to, this is kind of a cool story, is Alan Wurzel, who's the, the president of, of research for NBC Universal, has been for a long time. And of course, you know, we own NBC Universal. We're all the same family. And I got to build a relationship with him and got to speak at his offsite and present on some of the, the really cool research we've done and some awesome videos of people navigating our interface and talking about how passionate they are about TV. And it led to a relationship there. So it's just been growing organically, but it's really just about, you know, uh, finding your champion and then spreading the word and letting them spread the word and taking those opportunities every single time it's presented to you to just go get in front of more people and share what you do and how exciting it is. I think one of the keys too is, you know, when I present, I try to bring so much enthusiasm about the subject um, to really go in there. I, I love to be like animated up in the front of the room. I love to show videos and I put a lot of effort and I, I challenge my team to really be creative with their videos and make sure that they're, they're really engaging. And, and I think that the videos often sometimes have a really awesome impact and help humanize the experience. So I think that, that some of that's the turning point as well. Just being able to share your work in a really engaging way, I think, makes a big difference. I'm going to try a leading question because I, I, there's a little bit of uh, – I mean, a good leader is humble about their accomplishments. And I mean, I, there's a certain humility in your answer in that you talked a lot about other people's interest in your work kind of drove the, the, the growth of, of the demand. But, I mean, I, 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 I want to push you a little bit. And, and, and can you talk about, uh, you know, things that were – like work is not work is not just work. There's work that's relevant. There's work that you know uh, points to opportunities. There's work that connects. You're able to in order to drive that kind of increasing demand. It's not just about being animated. Like it's it's all the things that you said. But there's something I bet that's in the content of what you and your team have been producing. Um, and I wonder. Again, mm-hmm. I'm totally leading you, um, <laughs> but I wonder if you can, with all due humility, reflect on um, what about the content of the work that you've done that has had driven that organic growth? So with all due humility, it's it's really about, I always say, you know, our, our team's goal is to really um, bring, the word empathy doesn't mean like you, you, you feel sorry for someone or, you, you know, it's really about I think uh, Indy Young just wrote the book about empathy and I was reading it and I was like, that's exactly what it is. It's like being able to see, put yourself in someone else's shoes, but not necessarily understand it because it's not your world. And I've had, you know, stakeholders say to me after a readout or say to members of my team that, you know, not necessarily that we didn't, we learned anything new or that we didn't know, um, but you really humanized it. You really illustrated it in a way that was so impactful that we didn't realize, you know, it, 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 it caused this kind of emotion in our customers or you know the problem was this was the problem or or this wasn't the problem like this is really the heart of it so it's about being able to illustrate and bring empathy and just humanize the experience for um, folks who really aren't out there necessarily interacting with our customer users on every every day like like we are Um, I think that just that that's where the passion comes from I don't know if I'm answering your question no you're answering it (laughs) and it's a a wonderful answer you know I have this experience a lot in in years of doing research Research with the, it's sort of the classic response when you share something that you've learned is that we already knew that response, um, and it, you just kind of have flipped it around for me where it's not because sometimes that's um, that's sort of confrontational and and, and sometimes my response is to get defensive. Well, are you sure you knew it? And and I think what you're you're sort of talking about, uh, I mean, kind of a cultural organizational value in doing this work is is uh, as you said to humanize, and it's not about oh my God, did you know that this thing is going on? And because that might not, you might not be able to surprise anyone with that, but to, to bring it back in a way that humanizes. I think what, what, what I'm drawing from what you're saying too is that that's a powerful way to drive change or to help people take action based on what, what rediscover or represent. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it was kind of an epiphany when someone said that to me that, you know, because sometimes we would, we'd be like, oh, well, you know, I don't know if we're really like bringing any new insights here, the things we already knew. But when someone said, you know, it's not about necessarily bringing us anything new. And I don't want to say that we don't bring new insights because we bring tons of them. And I know we do. And we, we've affected a lot of change. But there's some things that just the company knows and they know they need to change. Um, but nobody's really ever told it in the type of storytelling manner that, that we bring to the table where like, you know, the end to end experience with, with video 
videos of people showing them, you know, the, their passion, their, their joy or their frustration um, and really talking about it in an eloquent way or even things like when we go in the homes, you know, we often try to get multiple family members in the interview because that's when you can really get the, the genuine uh, emotion and confusion and frustration out, you know, and I've shown videos of, of husbands and wives getting into arguments over like how to actually use an interface. That tells a way better story than I could ever tell um, putting together a presentation that shows like, a, you know, for example, a matrix of tasks and who succeeded and who failed. It's a far more powerful story to say like, hey, this is really confusing and I'm going to show you a video of a husband and wife arguing about it because one understands it and the other one doesn't. This makes me think about uh, documentary films a little bit and there's there's documentary films that I like and ones that I sort of, I don't know, almost tolerate. Um, and I, I will bring this back to what you just said. You know, there are those documentary films where it's about a topic and the topic is so amazing. It seems like what the filmmaker has done is sort of open the lens and sort of be there and then kind of chop it up in a way that, that follows a linear narrative. And you're like, I can't believe these people are, um, you know, trying to win a truck by standing on it and like a hands on a hard body. It was like a classic mm -hmm. documentary. Like it, you just saw people trying to, I don't know if you know this one, it's a contest to win a, car, a truck and you have to have your hand on it for days and days and days. And this amazing human drama like emerges from this very simple thing and not to minimize the art of the filmmaker there, but then there are other documentaries that just do, I don't know, just wildly creative things and sort of synthesize and pull out of something, some story you never could have ever found that like they've told that story. Um, and I, I enjoy them both, but I like to sort of reflect on sort of what's the hand of, of the of the filmmaker. And I know we're not there is an art to what we do, but that's not we're not making art. So just to loop it all the way back around to to what you're talking about, um, it is powerful to bring those stories in and kind of you know impact mm -hmm. people that way. Um, again, it's I'll, I guess I'm going to lead by offering my point of view. Um, I would hate for someone to listen to this and feel like what their field researcher does is just like point the lens at people and sort of that we're just scooping. We're not digging or we're not synthesizing. You know, so when you come back with those videos of the husband and wife arguing, like you didn't just, you weren't just out shooting video, you were doing something else. Mm -hmm. So obviously, no, we're, we're doing a lot more. We're probing in a really meaningful way. I mean, and, and I actually, um, I've, I've given talks here at, at Comcast to two groups of product managers. Um, you know, last year, Charlie Heron, who's our uh, now our uh, head of, of customer experience in a whole new group, um, had asked me to set up a, a training program for all the product managers so that they could come right along or be empowered to go do their own, you know, listening in the call centers or right along with, with agents. Um, but to really understand, like, w what is the art of what we do and how, how do you listen to customers? And I talk about things like how, how to build rapport, how you want to go in. You don't want to necessarily go in with an agenda. You want to ask open-ended questions. Don't be leading. But it's so important to build rapport because once you build a comfort level with, your, with the people who you're visiting, you're visiting them in your home. Um, it's amazing how they'll start to open up with you. And, and it gets to the point where I think I ripped this from your book, but I say this anyway. It, it does have a tipping point from where it's question and answer to question to story to it's just you say something and they just start talking. And that's the point that we really always strive to get to. Um, and that, that, that takes experience, that takes practice. And I think that, that that's really important. It's the, it's the art of the art of having a conversation because that's really what we're going in there to do. And sometimes you don't know where, um, where a, a, a a participant's going to take you and, that, and that's okay sometimes you can get real, some of the most richest or most interesting insights when the participant takes you down the path that's most interesting to them and then you can bring it back to some of the things that you want to learn about but I really think that, that, that it's so important to be open-minded and, and let the participant talk to you and show you you know what's most important to them there's an interesting tension and I don't I'm, I don't know that either of us can resolve it or at least not in this conversation between that um you know, the territory with no map. I don't know, like the, the, yeah. the exploring to get to what you don't know you're going to get to. At the same time, the result is things that you mostly knew or knew to some extent, but maybe not maybe not with this amount of emotion or this amount of kind of richness. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a good example that I can share. Um, when we first got into the home security arena, you know, it was maybe 
three or four years ago, um, we went to go do a, a field study with some of our early customers. And, you know, we were just hoping to learn. You, we were still mostly UX product. We wanted to see how are they using the system? What are the different ways they're using the system, you know, to, to improve it or to be inspired for, you know, new, new features or ways to, to improve the UI of, of some of the apps and, or the touchscreen or things like that. And what we found actually was a direct correlation between, you know, how engaged people were with actually using their home security system and how well their, their installation and first-time use of the system was. And that wasn't something we were looking for at all. That was something that started to come out naturally as my lead researcher was in the field. And she came back with this, like, amazing story and this amazing end-to-end process map that was like, well, you know, it was like six steps. And, you know, we went in the home with this expectation of studying what was step six and what we learned was x y and z about steps one through five and how it affects step six you know and step one is just becoming aware of the system step two is calling in to order it step three is getting it installed you know all these things that happened along the way and that was because the participants wanted to talk about that and we found it necessary to let them talk about that to understand why they were or were not using the system in a certain way so that's an example i think of 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 this sort of non-directed the power of being non-directed is there uh, so that's an example where the the you know using this non-directed approach helps you find something that you didn't know. But you've also talked about examples where there's a great power in the in the way that you can bring back stories that are not necessarily surprising, as you said, but they're brought back in a way. I'm just wondering, does that approach of uh, now I'm not messing up your words, but sort of a non-directed you know rapport building, letting the participant talk about what they want to talk about, does that also bring back? Things that you knew, but in that powerful way that's helping you drive change. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that, that we hear a lot about, we talk a lot about, obviously, in, in the world of cable and television is, is live television, right? And how attached are people to live TV? I guess in our own little rarefied world, we tend to think that um, people are really moving towards cord cutting and, 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 and you know, consuming everything on Netflix and over the top HBO and that kind of stuff. Yet we're going in the homes and we're seeing this incredible attachment still to live television. And we're still seeing that in a lot of the numbers too, and a lot of the Nielsen surveys and things like that. So we know it's true. And it seems like there's this dichotomy. People want to understand it better. So we can go in the homes and you find that people, um, when you let them speak in a non-directed way, all of a sudden they start talking about like, you know, why they're attached to live TV. And it has a lot to do with like a lean back experience versus maybe a lean forward experience. You know, we, we think of live TV very much as like, oh, well, it's still that classic, you know, Alan Wurzel would call it, um, you know, television, you know, the way God intended you to watch it. That's what he says. Like everyone sits down at eight o'clock to watch the Cosby show on Thursday nights. Um, but really the attachment to live TV is so much into sports, into the low commitment, into the serendipity, into I just, you know, want to flip around and see what's on, you know, for the next 20 minutes. Um, while I decompress, like that kind of thing. And, and I think we tend to overlook that. So to be able to bring back videos of people showing, like, you know, they all have different strategies for browsing the grid, the traditional grid, but but how that's happening to really illustrate that, to explain, like, why there's still an attachment to it. Um, but letting people show us, you know, through the context of their own stories and letting us take us down whatever path they want is, is really interesting and, and really meaningful. I, I feel like you just hit on what that point what the power is of those humanizing stories they're not necessarily surprises but they can help people reprioritize or you know we knew that we weren't really paying attention to it Mm -hmm. um you know by humanizing it you're you're helping people to make decisions and understand that something's really important that doesn't have to be a surprise that blows your hair back it can be right it's almost like it is really important so you know we definitely want to still make sure we have a strong way to help people you know browse what's on live and it's not to say we shouldn't be looking at like alternative ways to do that in the future we know that live tv is still important we know this from numbers we know this anecdotally even though you know anecdotally there's also the sense of there's still cord cutting but being able to go in the homes and ask people to just like hey take me through your day in tv and having them illustrate that sort of brings home this notion that you know some of these behaviors are still happening and we knew they were still happening you know here's a way to illustrate them and 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 make people help people understand why it's still so important and so meaningful to the user what do you think uh What are some of the challenges that, and maybe it's less about your team, but just the the kind of work? I mean, you know, user research as a thing, you know, in an organization like yours where, you know, you're having these successes and you've, you you know, you're having this kind of impact, um, you know, what's, what, what, how do you characterize the types of challenge that, that you all are looking to address? I mean, some of the challenges that we've been we've been looking to address lately, at least with my team, is is we've historically been a qualitative research team, you know, and, and qualitative research is is intrinsically um, linked to traditional market research techniques. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of familiarity with with many stakeholders outside of UX and 
especially outside of UX and product with, with those methods. So really trying to bring in that, that, that awareness of how important it is to, um, you know, we're talking a lot about talking to people, but really the heart and soul of what we do is we come in, we build rapport, and then we get them showing us. And that's really what usability is too. You bring people in, but you watch them use your system. When we go in their homes and we try to get them to just recreate their lives and watch them. Um, So really, you know, trying to illustrate like different approaches to qualitative research and trying to help explain what those different approaches were. That's been one challenge that that, that I think we're starting to really um, successfully um, illustrate. And then the other challenge too is like I said, we've always traditionally been a qualitative research group. And, you know, everybody loves numbers. Everybody loves analytics, um, surveys and stuff. So we've started to I have a quantitative researcher on my team now, and we're starting to, to bring in some of the quant to complement the qualitative research we're doing to, to emphasize some of the points that we're making, sort of establish some, some credibility to them at scale. And what's the difference between what a quantitative researcher in your team does versus other kinds of quantitative research that Comcast is doing? Uh, we're trying to do it from a product development approach. So, you know, one of the techniques that we, we, we just started implementing, or at least we started piloting, is Kano analysis. So, which is, you know, surveying in a specific way, asking people about features and their expectations, but not do you like it or are you satisfied with it, but do you expect it to be there? If it's not there, how, you know, are, are you upset? Are you indifferent? And there's a formula that, that, that sort of segments things, I believe, into like three outputs, the must-haves, the indifference, and then the delighters. You know, we're always getting, it, it kind of came because we're always being asked about what will delight our customers? What new features should we be building to delight people? It's a great language that really speaks to, to, to the company. And, um, you know, one of the interesting things we found, too, is that delighters decay into must-haves over time. So things, you know, for example, about the television interface that we would hear were delighters five years ago. Anecdotally, we kind of see how they've decayed into must-haves as we started to do some surveying. Like these are must-haves are things that people just expect to be there as a baseline, almost like a neutral. So anyway, having the – I think having some – some numbers behind it, but but not in a traditional way, but in a way that, that reframes it. Um, but again, it still amplifies things that we're hearing from other types of surveys and other other uh, groups in the company, I think is really, really powerful. It makes me think about uh, car features and how they seem, that industry seems to have sort of figured out, uh, you know, things come in at the ultra high end and then you know, now you can rent a Toyota Corolla at the airport and if they make Corollas or whatever, but, and it has a backup camera and whether that's driven by legislation and but whatever, all these features seem to trickle down. And it's a great uh, example. And is that the same? Do you think that's the same? I, I I don't know what's going on in the car industry. If they're if that's about economics or is that about you know? No, but that's a great example. Like right now, you know, backup cameras is a delighter, right? People who have them love it. But it's it's not standard, and there's still a lot of people out there driving cars that don't have them. But I would predict, you know, in five years, maybe that's just going to be a must-have and an expectation, especially if they're putting them in Corollas. <laughs> so, right. you know, it seems like that that's where you see the decay from delighter to must-have when it's it's no longer necessarily a luxury or something high-end, but something that's expected in, in any make and model. It seems like it's easy it's easy to see that framework in the car industry and mm-hmm. probably harder in in the things that you work on. Right. Because there's just not... It's probably more practical stuff in the things we work on, like, you know, the number of tuners that you can use at once to record shows, you know, it used to be like so exciting. I have a DVR, like, oh, my God, I can watch one show and record the other at the same time. And, um, you know, now, you know, people have four tuners and they can record four shows and, and watch one live at the same time. Five tuners, you need five tuners to do that. Um, and so like things like that have become more than must-haves. Same thing with internet, like the must-have, the speeds keep going up and how, how much you're able to download in a certain amount of time. Is the tuner thing about multiple viewers in a household? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes. Or sometimes it's about like a TV passionate. You know, there are people who are super attached to TV and they like to record a lot of things. They like to stockpile stuff. Right. So there's a lot of different behaviors out there that, that drive that. Right. I could just hear, I'm just, I'm, uh, I'm doing that thing that people do mm-hmm. where like five shows at once, that seems like a lot. What's wrong with that person? <laughs> um, but, you know, your answer is, of course, the appropriate, you know, empathetic one that like there's there's use cases that you support. And uh, I'm just doing that thing that, that people do. So Exactly. Yeah. You know, that's right. If you maybe there's a, how many people use five tuners at once? I actually I, I'm sure we have analytics on that, but it, it's even more the perception that, you know, uh, right. I think. Right. I bet the, inc- and I'm, you don't have to answer this, but I bet the incremental cost to add a third tuner and a fourth tuner is probably low. And so right now you have more capability. I mean, it goes back to the to what you're saying about, um, you know, things that are um, delighters versus must-haves. Mm-hmm. Like, 
and I've seen this in studies that I've done unrelated to your your business area where, you know, more capability than you think that you could possibly use is mm-hmm. like that's very comforting for people. Like mm-hmm. I'm I'm maybe set. A, a great example uh, a great example within the, the D V R space maybe is the uh like uh, remote D V R. So I remember when I was working on the the first app for mobile D V R, um oh my gosh, I wanna say that was like two thousand nine or so. Um, you know, where it was like super super exciting to like be able to be like oh my god i'm out and i forgot to set set the dvr and and now i can log in and actually set my dvr um that's just you know you can do that now it's 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 not it, it's still a delighter so i want to say i don't know that it's decayed to a must have but i would say for for it's it's getting close interesting okay let's um let, let's shift gears a little bit um you know you've talked about your team and some of the people on your team is there can you give kind of a um you know, like a, a, I don't know, a thousand foot view of the kinds of people, the kinds of skills, like what is, you know, what have you built and, and kind of who have you looked for and what's, sure. what's the makeup, I guess. Um, so like any UX research team, um, you know, we just come from a variety of different backgrounds, you know, the 31 flavors or whatever you want to call it. So my background's in physics. I've got people with backgrounds in information systems, anthropology. Um, you know, we've got we've got someone from CMU, Carnegie Mellon's graduate program. I've got people from a PhD at, at, at Temple. Um, so it's really definitely a, a definite mix. Um, and I think everyone on the team sort of, you know, has an area of, of strength. You know, I've got someone on the team who's just this absolutely amazing, almost like anthropologist, go out in the field. And, you know, some of the things we were talking about before, about just being non-directed and building rapport, just, you know, that's it's a real strength. Um, someone else on the team who really, really loves doing more of like the, the, the usability type evaluations. Um, like I said, I have a quantitative researcher on the team. So I don't want to say, you know, everyone's a generalist and we don't have the luxury of being specialized. But I think everyone on my team has a, an, an area of, um, of strength, I think. And I think it's really important to have that mix as well. You know, when we get an open head or, you know, we're looking to hire um, among my, my senior group, I have two managers on my team and a principal, you know, the four of us will sit down and talk about, you know, you know, what do we really need? What, what, what kind of skill sets do we need to, where do we have gaps or things like that? And, and we'll look for resumes and, and people who will fill that gap. I just have to call out open head as like the best piece of corporate jargon <laughs> that, that any of us are going to hear this week. I have an open head. I have an open head. <laughs> well, we're going to send you to the doctor, but <laughs> it just get makes, that stitched means up. means I have a requisition to hire somebody yeah, that's for a, a full-time job with benefits. <laughs> Um, because we, 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 you know, one of the things we talk about in user research, of course, is like using natural language right. with our customers. And, so. and do we talk about making fun of their natural language? Because that's the <laughs> that's the principle of interviewing that I just leveraged. Um, so when you when you're thinking about um, you know managing workload, how do you think about you know with, with people being generalists? How do you think about uh, you know here's a, an internal client with a need, here's who's going to work on that. How do you make those decisions? Um, That's a great question. Right now, I do have, I mentioned I have like a senior team, and I tend to have them uh, embedded in one subject matter area. So I have someone who's really leading most of the television and entertainment research, someone high-speed internet and home, and another one on customer experience. Um, Underneath that, I have a pool of researchers. They tend to move around a bit more. I like to try to keep people, you know, again, it's kind of like the strengths in terms of methodologies. I also have people who have affinity to certain, you know, subject matter. So, you know, I have someone on my team who's just a, a DIY geek about home automation. So I try to keep that person, you know, working in the home security, home automation space space because they just have a lot of subject matter uh, expertise there. So some of it's like, you know, if, if I can, and if the demand is there, or if the need is there, I'll try to keep people, you know, keep that, that subject matter uh, expertise like running so that we can leverage that and move faster and, and, and build upon, you know, insights from the past. So that's, that's kind of how we do it. And usually there's enough work balanced between each of the different um, uh, verticals that it isn't too much of a, you know, people aren't switching around too much. And so let's go back to the open head bit. Um, so now I'm using natural you love language. That term, well, yeah, I, I used I did it straight, and you giggled. So I was like, I was I'm back in natural Call me language, out of my right? Corporate lingo, okay. Right. Um, so when you you know when you're in an open head situation and you're looking at resumes, um, right? What I mean, what do you look? What do you look for? What do you and what do you see? What do you see and what do you want to see? I guess. What do you see and what do you want to see? Um, you know, it's hard with a resume, actually. I, I'm almost always more interested in if someone, you know, reaches out to me with a, with a note, you know. Um, 
or a personal connection. I mean, I can look at a resume and sometimes people have, you know, what, what looks like they check the boxes and then we'll want to talk to them. But it's really about evaluating someone, um, you know, over the phone then on that, that first pass. So the resume, you know, should have like, you know, you know I, some experience unless we're looking for someone really entry level, but even if they're entry level, you know, some sort of um, interest in, in doing something UX and user research related while they were in school. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's really more about, um, I would say, you know, how are you going to demonstrate to me your, your level of, of passion for user research and um, your soft skills? So like, for example, you know, I hired someone a few years ago and I actually got a note from one of our engineers or one of our scrum masters, I think she was. And she said, I met this, this woman at a party. She's getting ready to finish her master's degree at Temple. She's really, really interesting. And she had a background in mass communications and anthropology. She loved technology. And she was doing work in, like, presence. And she's just a really neat person. And I was telling her about your uh, – we, we have a co-op or like internship program. I was telling her about that and she wanted, she was interested. So, and I said, put her in touch with me. But to me, that's like the test, right? Put her in touch with me and see if she actually gets in touch with me. Not only did she get in touch with me, she got in touch with me right away with this incredibly thoughtful email about um, all the different things she was thinking about. And she wasn't like, I want a job or, you know, I, I absolutely must have a career in UX research. She was almost like, I'm really interested in technology. I'm really interested in people. Not really sure where this is all going to go. And I would just love to learn more about your team and what you do. So I got on the phone with her and I just thought she, she had amazing aptitude. She had great maturity. Um, and so then I brought her in to meet the team. And we actually felt like she, she was qualified to be an entry-level researcher. You know, I thought she was way beyond an internship position. But it was really about, you know, the impression she made with me in terms of the way she communicated with me and communicated beyond, like, I know how to do these skills. It was more like I'm, I'm curious, which I can't teach, um, personable, I can get along with people, um, I ask good questions. Like, those are, those are things that are harder to teach, the aptitude. And she demonstrated that she had that. Some of those seem very general to, you know, trying to reach out to someone inside a company and make them feel like they would want to work with you. And some of them seem like there's elements of, like, this is what makes for someone who I want to have work with me as a researcher specifically. Mm -hmm. Can you highlight the... Like what are the what are the researcher ingredients and and how you're how you're trying to suss those out? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, a big one I just mentioned is curiosity. You know, like if you don't have a natural curiosity, um, then I, I can't teach you to be a researcher because that that that's it has to be ingrained in you, right? I mean, to be a researcher is to want to understand. You know, like I was that kid that was five years old, like why 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 why? You know, and I'm still like that as an adult. I'm just I need to know how things work. So I look for that. Um, another thing is, is like pattern recognition. I think a lot of being a researcher is, um, you know, when you're out, especially when you're doing qualitative work, like really being able to understand, you know, you hear this one story over here and you hear this one story over there and how are they related and what's the common thread between them? I'm trying to think of a good example off the top of my head. And of course, now I'm blanking. Um, but being able to really recognize patterns, I think, is important. Being a good listener, too. I talked about curiosity, but the, the other side of curiosity is uh, I love it when I interview somebody and then at the end when I say, do you have questions for me? Not only do they have questions, which demonstrates their curiosity, but they're not canned questions. They're questions based on things that I, I've talked about, about my team and about what we do. Um, so demonstrating that you can, you can actively listen and process what you're hearing and then ask thoughtful questions back, I think, is, is really critical. Um, you know, I can teach someone, you know, to go read about heuristics or go read a book you know, how to write tasks, how to run more ray, all these other hard skills. Um, but I can't necessarily teach someone how to be curious or, you know, how to be able to recognize patterns. I'm trying to think of another good one that I look for. I mean, maybe it's the soft skills, too, because to be a researcher, you know, you're, you really need to be able to just interact with people and make them feel comfortable. So I look for people who are good conversationalists, who are just, you know, comfortable talking to people they haven't met before, come in you know, have a certain amount of um, confidence to them with, with still some humility. Because that's what you need when you're going to be going in and interviewing customers. And that's also what you need when you walk in the room to present to your stakeholders. You know, you have to be sensitive to their needs as well and, and, and what they need to hear in order to take action on, on your findings. You know, and you may get some, when you're presenting too, you know, you get questions at the end. And sometimes the questions can, can be challenging, right? You know, you know, especially if like, you know, something that you're presenting on isn't, um, you know, finding sort of challenges like, you know, one of their core beliefs about what they thought about their product. 
Um, so how do you handle those questions? You know, how do you react in that kind of a situation where you, you know you might be might be challenged? I think is really important to observe as well. What's the soft skill that uh, that describes that? Like being able to handle these questions? Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm not sure what the word is for it. Um, it must be categorized. It must be categorized, <laughs> right? You're going to make me dig back into my IA world, my brain. Oh. No. <laughs> um, I think it's about not being, you know, um, I, I mean, it might be it is humility. You know, it's not being so attached to your idea and your agenda that, you know, you, you need to be able to compromise. That's a great challenge in an interview situation to be able to demonstrate your confidence and your humility together. Yeah, it is. Like, isn't that's, it? that's a bit of a, of a magic trick. And it I'm not is. saying that people can't pull it off. It is sort of about mm-hmm. who you are as a person. But, you know, if I had to think about how would I how would I do that, I would definitely have to scratch, be scratching my head and want to practice that a little bit. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. Those are essential. Um, but you just, I don't know, makes me have some empathy for people that are knocking on doors and trying to mm-hmm. put all those best feet forward at the same time. Yeah. All right, let's switch gears again and maybe sort of build on this. You talked a little about, I feel like at the top of the conversation, you mentioned some of your other uh, experiences and that you'd had, you know, you, you've had other careers before this one. Or, um, you want to talk a little about your background and maybe some of the some of the, the highlights or milestones for you as you have? Yeah, sure. Um, how much time do you have? Just kidding. Um, how much time do you have? How much time have? do we have left? No, just kidding. Yeah. So, you know, it, my degree is, my undergraduate degree is actually in physics, um, which I always joked after I was done. The only reason we, my friend and I would say we majored in physics is because we like, we like the way it kind of stopped the conversation at a party when someone would ask us what we did, what we majored in. You know, I, I kind of grew up being just, you know, one of those women that was smart at math and science, which, which is a little bit unusual, especially, you know, 20 years ago. And uh, I just assumed I'd major in math and science. And and then when I was in school, I was working in labs. And I was like, God, this is so boring. There's no way I can do this the rest of my life. You know, I thought I would just get a PhD and, you know, go do research and get published in in journals. And I just thought, God, how boring is that? So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I I went to Penn and I worked in their admissions office. And and through that, I actually just got a job right out of school doing as an admissions counselor for a local college for a couple years, which, which wasn't as interesting as being an admissions officer for a school like Penn. You know, um, but I, I thought it would be cool. But really, the lessons I took away from that, it, you know, it was a lot about being independent, being on the road, um, learning how to sell, how to speak to things, how to present. And I, I knew that wasn't, you know, wasn't going to be my career or anything. So I had a friend working for a textbook company, Prentice Hall, big, big, big name. And she was working up at their headquarters and said, hey, we have an opening for a marketing assistant. You'd be great. And it's in science and math textbooks. So ended up getting a job up there. And again, I think some of the things I learned up there, first of all, I worked for two really awesome women who were, you know, in leaders in, in the marketing area. You know, they taught me, you know, not to be afraid to sell myself and to make sure that people knew that I was like doing a good job. It wasn't enough to get a compliment. It was to make sure you forwarded your compliments on so that people who could help your career knew that you were being acknowledged. You know, and I knew, I remember one time uh, they were talking about moving me up to manage a a big sales territory in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is, you know, in the textbook industry, you want to move up, you you often need to go manage a sales territory, you need to go out into the field. And um, one of them said to me, she's like, you need to go knock on everyone's door of these executive editors and stuff and just ask their advice and let them know you're interested in this position. And I like freaked out and I got like all nervous and stuff. And they're like, no, you have to go do that because these are the people who are going to promote your career. So I got like really good advice that way, you know, and they were from women, which I thought was really important. So anyway, I spent five years doing sales, marketing and, and editorial acquisitions in the science and math space and textbooks, which is the only job I ever had that was even tangentially related to my, my degree when I was working on physics textbooks. And I was actually a little conversant with the authors. But th- that was where I sort of made the transition to UX. I always loved, um, I always loved graphic design and typography. And um, people told me that like I was too smart to do that and I would never make any money. And I finally just decided, well, I, I didn't care. I really loved it. And uh, we were working on a brand new textbook for biology. And the biology editor, I was talking to her about this a little bit. And she pulled out this book. It was Richard Saul Werman's Information Architects book. And it profiled people like Eric, Eric Speakerman and... Um, you know, a lot of really just, just interesting people who thought about how to design things. This is way back in the print age or signage systems and stuff, but thought about how to, how to design things 
based on how people were going to actually use them. And I was like, this is, this is just awesome. And they were hiring someone as a consultant who was featured in that book to help design like the, the program for how they were going to design this, this new textbook. I just thought that was so cool. And so I finally just decided, you know what, I think I want to change careers. And I left Prentice Hall, I kept doing some freelance work, but I started studying graphic design full time at uh, School of Visual Arts. And sort of a, you talk about key moments, a key moment for me is I was taking a typography class. And we were supposed to redesign a spa brochure. And uh, it was just one of those handmade things on like, I, I don't know, like, a, were, you know, like, a, 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 I forget what they were called at the time. It was just one of those things where anyone could put together a brochure on their desktop computer. And it was pretty ugly. And uh, we we're supposed to just redesign it with, you know, nice type and special attention to typography. And, and I actually rewrote all the content before I redesigned it. And I was the only person that did that. And I came back in and I remember a couple of the other students were like, why did you do so much work? And I was like, I can't design something I don't understand. And that was like almost like the epiphany for me. And um, that's when I realized I was actually probably more of an information architect than a designer. (laughs) And so that's how I got into, made the transition into UX. And that was, it wasn't even called UX at the time, obviously. This was like around 2000, 2001. But it was the right time, right place to sort of jump into that, that arena And uh, so I moved back to Philadelphia, which is where I'm from, and through some connections, you know, got a job at a a local agency, basically doing jack of all trades, what would be UX now, small agency uh, that that built websites for nonprofits and and educational clients. And so I did everything. I did um, stakeholder interviews, uh, content strategy, information architecture, you know, building site maps, actually did the visual design. I even did some, you know, front end HTML. So that's where I really learned all my chops. And then from there, I just got really excited about understanding how people would actually like use the stuff I was designing back to like, you know, thinking about Eric Spiekermann and the, uh, the, the case study of how he, you know, thought about redoing the map for the Berlin subway, I think it was. And um, anyway, that's when I went off to Institute of Design for grad school and learned about design research and then got really excited about, you know, watching users and learning what they do. And so from there, I just went to Steelcase for a couple of years, um, worked for a really awesome woman there named Joyce Bromberg, who, again, was just a great inspiration. She was the one. She'd give me a compliment, and I'd be your typical woman, like, oh, it was no big deal. And she'd be like, take it like a man. Say thank you. <laughs> and so she taught me to always just say thank you when someone compliments me. You know, you never downplay your, uh, your successes. And um, it was neat to be out of the digital arena for a while, and then I decided I wanted to move back to Philly, and I've been here at Comcast ever since. So I think I asked you how much time you had, and that was probably the longest answer ever. No, I thought you'd like manage to to do like a really clipped, uh, swift kind of uh, active version of uh, of a whole career arc. That's great, um, and you know I think we, we we will keep paying attention to time here. You know, what are some things about you as a as a leader or a manager that I think um, might be important for us to understand? There may be things that we wouldn't see on your LinkedIn profile. I mean, I don't know if this would come through in my LinkedIn profile. But, you know, as I've, as I've moved up, I, I never thought I would be a manager, let alone a director or a senior director. You know, when I started here at Comcast, it was like, hey, here's this lab. When I started up, I thought I'd be a team of one, probably forever. <laughs> no, actually, I didn't. But I, I think as I've moved up and, and gotten more into the, the management side of things, I've really found, like, a passion for passing it forward. You know, as I was talking about in the past, you know, some of these great mentors I've had who, you know, taught me how to take a compliment or make sure other people knew my successes or, um, you know, taught me how to be patient and have a vision for something. I think that's something I didn't talk about before. You know, sometimes people ask me, like, how did you, you know, how did you grow this team so quickly? You know, because I know that can be a struggle for some folks, you know, in the corporate world trying to build up fledging UX or user research practices. How do you go from a team of one to 10? So short amount of time, you know, and it's really having having the patience. It's like you're not going to go from one to 10 in one year. It's, it's like celebrate your small successes and, and, and have a vision for where you want to go, but be patient for it. So I think it's kind of passing that forward um, to the folks below me. You know, I'm really interested. I read a lot of books on, um, you know, how to motivate what people are motivated by. And, and trying to understand like a little bit about, you know, the psychology of, of you know, that aspect of, of our work and really trying to, you know, do for some of the younger folks what, what those folks did for me and, you know, and helping them, you know, build their confidence, um, move their own careers forward, you know, feel like they, they can do it and, and to, to figure out what you want to do and, and, you know, not be afraid to take risks. Um, so as we think about wrapping up, I will uh, fall back as I often do in my stock questions because I'm a creature of habit or I'm lazy or something else? Because they're great questions. Um, is there anything that we should have talked about, about you and you know your work at Comcast or your background that you'd like to make sure that, uh, that, that we include in this? 
I mean, again, just just to sum up, I think one of the things that maybe that isn't emphasized enough, you know, we, we talk a lot within UX about like the hard skills and the methods and stuff like that. And I know you go around, I think you said you were just at World IA Day and you gave soft skills are hard and, and like that, you know, and I think that that's just that's just so important. And I think that's something I'd love to emphasize to folks that's so important in your career. Don't don't neglect your soft skills. And I think I got lucky in that I had this you know, that period for five, six years where I was, you know, working as a, basically like almost in a sales and marketing capacity where I learned to be comfortable, you know, interacting with others, people, you know, learning how to work a room, learning how to make conversation with people I I, I really didn't know, um, learning how to negotiate, learning how to present. And then again, something I think I talked about is, you know, never turn down an opportunity. So I've had people like present opportunities to me, like I I gulp really hard and then I'm really glad I did it, you know? And, And one example is, um, the University of Pennsylvania actually, they contacted me a few years ago um, for uh, to come back and speak on a panel at Parents Weekend. And if you know anything about Penn, Penn's a very pre-professional school. So, you know, you basically go there and if you don't say, I want to be a doctor, lawyer, an eye banker or a consultant, it's like, oh my God, what's my child going to do and how are they going to make any money? And so they, they had noticed that I had this unusual major and this unusual career, yet I seemed to be pretty successful. So they invited me to come back and speak on this panel. And I remember when the guy called me and I was thinking, all right, you know, I'll do it. And then when he told me there'd be like 400 people in the audience, I almost choked because I had never spoken to a crowd that big before. I think the biggest crowd I ever spoke to was maybe 40 or 50 people. I just like flipped out and I was like, okay, I'll do it. And it was just so energizing and so much fun. And I think, you know, that, that was the beginning of like, so when Alan Wurzel invited me to speak at his offsite and they said that would be like 200 people, I was like, I got a little nervous, but now I've gotten to the point where like, I'm super comfortable speaking in front of large groups. To the point where, like, now I can almost do it on the fly if I already have the content ready and I'm not afraid to, um, to be animated or to tell stories um, or even be a little self-deprecating in front of a large group, which helps, like, humanize yourself and, and build some rapport with your audience. So don't ever be afraid to take an opportunity, even if it scares you, because um, you always learn something for it. And the more you do something, the more comfortable you become doing it. So I think that that's, that's just really important. But Liz, what if I fail? Well, you can't think that, right? You, you, I don't know. You know, someone actually asked me that once. I'm so I'm so glad you said that because someone asked me. I remember I was working at Prentice Hall. I can't remember the context now, but they said, well, what if you fail? And I, and I was just like, I'm not afraid I'm going to fail. I don't know. Maybe that's something in, intrinsic. I, I guess don't be afraid of failure either. Well, I like, I mean, it, just your framework is revealed when that question sort of just brings you up short. Like, Right. I, 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 I don't know. I'm not thinking about that. Right. So, and yeah. it sounds like cocky. We've been talking about humility. and I'm like, well, I've never failed. Um, I mean, sure, I've, I've failed here and there, but it's it, it's not really failure. Maybe it was like a little bit of a setback. Oh, you know, this, this didn't go. I didn't get that job that I wanted to get. But, you know, I got the confidence to do even better on the next interview and got another job that turned out to be even better. So yeah, I didn't hear you say I've never failed. I heard you say like, I'm not afraid don't, of it. Don't think about don't think about it in terms of if what if you fail. Right. You and sort of were attacking the question, not not. I didn't hear you say I I don't fail. No. Okay. Well, that's those are some lovely sort of parting yeah. thoughts. I guess just to wrap up, wrap up. Do you have any questions? I don't think so. No. You Has, have other people asked you questions? That's is that a question? Is that a meta question or an actual <laughs> question? Have question. other people asked me questions? <laughs> Yeah, sometimes. I don't know. You know. Steve, is there anything else that, that I could add that would be a unique perspective? I, I listened to your, your other, some of your other podcasts, and you know, there's always been a lot of talk about the methods and the structure of the team. I think we covered that a bit, though. But if there's anything unique. Well, I mean, I yeah, you're, you're going to ask me if there's anything unique about you. But only, <laughs> yeah, really. You're, you're the person <laughs> that can answer that. <laughs> okay. That sounds like we're done then. All right. Thanks very much, Liz. Thanks, Steve. Okay, that's a wrap for this episode of Dollars to Donuts. Our glittering sponsors are Airbnb's Experience Research Team, making authentic local experiences possible anywhere in the world. The Pinterest Research Team, who work with designers, engineers, and everyone in between to build the world's most inspiring catalog of ideas. And Envision, the world's leading product design and prototyping platform. Sign up free at envisionapp.com. We're still lining up sponsors for the second half of this season, and we'll be back with new episodes as soon as that gets sorted out. If you want to be a sponsor, get in touch. Our rocking and rolling theme music is by Bruce Todd. You can find the links for this episode, read the transcript, check out other episodes, and subscribe at portable.com slash podcast. If you don't already own a copy of Interviewing Users, 
wait and let me pick myself up off the floor and stare at you in disbelief. Okay then, get it from Amazon or from Rosenfeld Media. Get in touch with me at Portugal.com and let's start exploring how we can work together.